even our current modern ideologies, as sophisticated as they think they are, are doing the same thing that ancient mythologies did, which is to conceal the corpse of the human species at all costs. That is David Garnoski. He is an entrepreneur, a speaker, and writer who has contributed to the Foundation for Economic Education, the Mises Institute, and many others. He's also the host of the Orlando-based radio program, Neighbor's Choice, and a podcast entitled Things Hidden. Today, we're going to be talking about Rene Girard's mimetic theory, which has been called the theory of everything. This is a fascinating conversation, which will introduce you into a radically new way of understanding history, the present world, and perhaps where we're going. David, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me. It's been uh, great to be on your program. Yeah, so uh, like we were, we're talking about uh, off, offline here uh, j- just a few minutes ago, I, I first heard you, you know, on the Tom Wood show where you talked about the mimetic theory of Rene Girard, which is uh, the, t- the whole entire topic of kind of delving into philosophy is something I'm kind of doing over this next month as well. And, you know, like I said, I kind of got interested. I'd heard about it, but I hadn't really read anything about it. And since then, my just very early parts of this journey has been, you know, absolutely, you know, mind blowing as far as for understanding the implications of this theory. And, you know, I I was actually wondering if we could just start off with who Rene Girard was. Well, that's, uh, uh, there's a lot to this man, but he had one simple theory. Uh, It's called the mimetic theory. And he was a professor at several universities. He landed finally at Stanford University, where he became most well-known for his tenure there. And he taught a young Peter Thiel, who went on to use the uh, uh, framework of the mimetic theory to write the book Zero to One, which is a multi-million best-selling uh, uh, how to understand startups, how to create uh, monopolies, how to create uh, differentiation in a undifferentiated marketplace. And uh, that also is the... Uh, mimetic theory was also the thing that Peter Thiel was inspired by to uh, invest in a young Mark Zuckerberg at 19 years old, which turned into a, a multi-billion return. So uh, uh, that just gives you a little preview for those who are familiar with Rene Girard, how important his work is, because it gives you the toolkit to be able to make those kinds of predictions in the marketplace uh, for one, but also more importantly for bigger questions like who we are as human beings and what is the nature of human society? Where did humans uh, pick up their patterns of ritual and behavior and their and their uh, need for belonging and transcendence? How do they create order with those uh, feelings they have? And it also talks about even something more fundamental, which is the nature of human desire, the nature of human conflict, the nature of human identity. But mimetic theory is a uh, throwback to an older type of theory that was more popular at the time uh, in the, let's say, uh, 1800s when there was more of the uh, romantic spirit. There was more of a, you know, you had Charles Darwin with his unified theory of biology. uh, And uh, Girard came about, of course, past that time. He was uh, uh, born in the, uh, I believe, 1920s, uh, 20, I don't know what exact year. But uh, he, he was kind of a throwback to the era before where you would have a unified theory of knowledge. And uh, Girard came into academia uh, teaching uh, literature. He was a historian and he was teaching literature, French literature. And in the time that he arrived in academia, the uh, in vogue thing to do was to look for uh, the um, social construction of all texts in the sense that there was no uh, underlying meaning that one could derive from the text and novels and so forth. It was all social construction. Whatever you determine the uh, meaning to be in a novel is what you determine it to be. And the author's uh, work is simply kind of a reflection of different uh, social constructions of his own identity or her own identity that are not inherently objective to the text, that you can place that kind of 
subjective interpretation into the text however you want based on your own social construct of reality. And Gerard was totally in a different vein than that because he was interested in in seeing how all the different texts had a unifying pattern. So he was looking for objective truth. He was looking for the common patterns that were found in each of these different uh, texts, uh, the patterns of conflict, the patterns of, of uh, what he called triangular desire. Uh, that you found in all the great, most profound works of Western literature. And so that's what he was doing. And, uh, and he used that early work in literature as the basis for his grand unified theory of mimetic theory, which actually is a, as a unified uh, social science theory. It encompasses anthropology, uh, literature, you know, history, uh, ethnology, um, you know, psychiatry, the whole, uh, there's so many different fields it applies to. And in economics, there's a lot of economists that are using mimetic theory to do work in that field. So it was a really uh, kind of a, a tour de force that has had a huge implication uh, on a lot of different disciplines. And it's one of those things that I can assure you that as we continue to go into the 21st century, that Girard's impact and our understanding of the world that we're in will be much, much more important than the impact of Freud, Marx, and, um, and Nietzsche combined, I think. Well, what was it? Uh, I mean, how did you come across uh, Girard's work originally? And, and what was it that um, kind of got you to really, you know, to, for it to jump out at you and for you to really kind of take notice of it versus, because there's so many different, you know, uh, theories of, of social construction and, and how the, you know, I guess how people operate, how history uh, operates and, and the people within it. Okay. What was you that me last comment? Yeah. I did. For some reason it, it cut out. Just say it again, please. I was saying you know, what, what jumped out at you uh, to, to make you kind of really take notice of this because there's so many different competing theories of how things work or, you know, uh, the, why people act that the way that they do, or the fact that though there's, there's a lot of thought, especially nowadays in, in the kind of the postmodernist somewhat, I, not that they're the dominant thought, but they're a, a growing dominant thought over the last 50 years of that. There, there, there really is no objective truth. There really is nothing that unifies, um, you know, humanity or, you know, history or, um, you know, the, the, the I guess the sacred texts of humanity that they're all just kind of ways that people were just kind of trying to figure out how the world worked, but it's mostly just junk. Well, I'd been on my own quest for some time trying to put the patterns together in the Bible uh, to understand that there was so much more power and significance and relevance to the story of Jesus and its impact on our culture for good or ill uh, than most Christian conversations wanted to uh, consider. And uh, I was raised in a Christian uh, background in uh, church community life and so forth. And I had, and over time, explored various denominations just to understand, not, not as a, just to understand uh, the direction of of how these different thought traditions in Christian theology played out. And I was always, I always kind of came to the conclusion, I liked a lot of things about Christianity, but always felt like the way the faith was, uh, was taught in most of the traditions, even the smart and intelligent, uh, you know, communities, there was a lack of, uh, it, it almost seemed like an impotent, truncated view of Jesus as if um, I, I, I drew an illustration one time to illustrate this. It's as if you're trying to, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to glimpse at the picture of the crucified Jesus, but there's an, a mob of people with cross shaped daggers with crosses, with the tip of it being a dagger that are all crowding out your glimpse of the cross. And those folks are the people who oftentimes 
believe they're representing Jesus, but in fact are representing a crowd, hive mind, a group think, uh, social clique that really don't have the full picture of the significance of Jesus in mind when they are trying to present it. And so I was actually working on my own book, writing and thinking and talking about the um, kind of the social ordering principles that Jesus's life unveils in our own world. And the I, I saw a complete connection. I'll put it this way. I was I, I felt like it was there's something weird about the fact that you read these stories about Jesus and then you hear, you know, Christianity talked about and talked about by its own parishioners and so forth or practitioners, and, and you hear you hear this uh, you know, this is what Christianity is. I believe in this. I believe in that. I believe in this. I believe in that. And and you need to do this and you need to think that and you need to do these things. And those are all fine. I don't have a problem with those things. But I was like, why, why is it so truncated? It seems like it's all dealing with things in the neocortex. It's all dealing with things that are related to almost like a Cartesian model of reality. You know, I think blank. Therefore, I am blank. In this case, I think the doctrine of the Trinity, therefore I am Christian. I think the doctrine of this type of understanding of baptism or soteriology or, uh, you know, the study of how we're saved, the study of the end times, the study of the church body. Uh, I believe in this tradition, orthodoxy. I believe in Roman Catholicism. I believe in this type of Protestantism. Therefore, I am a Christian at the best of that it is to be. And I kept thinking to myself, this is such a truncated view of looking at human nature, human human desire, human, uh, you know, social life is so much richer and deeper than this, I think blank, or and I do this type of baptism, or I do this type of Trinity model, and I do this kind of polity, and therefore I am a Christian. And I thought, why is it that all these groups, they all emphasize this such a limited part of the full complex of what it means to be human, to the point that in order for you to get the rest of what it means to be human worked out in your life, you have to go supplement it with uh, political philosophy. You got to go look if you want to understand the justice of the of the legal system. You got to understand political philosophy. You got to read Bastiat, or you got to go understand free market economics. You got to go read, you know, Austrian economists or, or other folks that are doing things in that field. If you want to understand the nature of psychology, you got to go study, you know, if you whatever your field of interest there, Carl Jung, like uh, Jordan Peterson does, or you know, this is before him though. That I was looking at this, and then and then you know, um, uh, or before he became you know a national figure. But the the uh, and then and then if you want to understand the the effects of Christianity in our time and the and the effects of the Christ figure in opposition to the crowd psychology of, of, of all the different things that humans encounter, then you got to go to Nietzsche and stuff. And I thought, why do we have to have all these supplements, you know, that are not, you know, explicitly framed within a Christian worldview of what you're supposed to think about the world and, and how you work it out. And, you know, I just thought, you know, maybe our concept of Christianity is a little, um, dead. Maybe it's a little truncated. Maybe it doesn't have the full picture in mind. And so I started writing about it. And then I discovered Gerard's work and it had a lot of uh, parallels with what my own writing was. And so I just took some time and I said, you know what, if I, I want to present these big ideas to the public, but Gerard has something very similar and he often goes in a different direction a little bit on some things than what I was working on. So I'm going to respect my elders. And I'm going to study this man's work and I'm going to help present what he's doing here and then tie it back into what I've been researching on my own independently. So, and I guess the the best way to, to segue into that is, you know, you talked about and, and what Girard's theory has been basically called is it's, it's the theory of everything. And to, to, I think that people will get, a, that the listeners will get a really good idea or be able to understand better, you know, just human history and why did this happen? Why did that happen? Um, why are there these common 
themes through there. Uh, so I was wondering if you could actually go a little bit into depth of his what his theory, his mimetic theory is, and the kind of the the central concepts within it. Well, the thing you have to one of the best ways to look at it is to look at in, in how it affects you know real life, you know the uh, or how it unfolds in real life, you know. So again. I was struck by how, you know, you could go into a church community and you would find the same kind of dynamics of cliques that you would find in a community based on some secular value or based on, hey, even something simple as high school. Cliques form and then they find their belonging and their purpose based on the mutual exclusion of an enemy other. And I thought, that's weird that this is even popping up in, in churches, because after all, Jesus was excluded as an enemy other by the community of his own time. And he was eliminated uh, because he violated, the, he violated the cliques, you know, kind of transcendent identity that kept them bound together. And so I was thinking, you know, how is this popping up as a phenomenon in churches and churches exclude and shun and, and, and uh, scapegoat uh, common enemies within their own community. And they do it with the same righteous fervor as if they're on the side of Christ, even though they're doing the same behavior to people that that Jesus experienced himself. That they're, they're, they're shunning and scapegoating people with an all against one psychological force in the same pattern of the ones who killed Jesus. And, and so I thought, that's weird that that pattern still emerges even in churches that are teaching Jesus ostensibly. But again, it goes back to the fact that if churches are teaching a Cartesian model, I think blank, therefore I am a Christian, then they don't have an anthropological foundation for what Jesus is all about. And so this is where you get into kind of like a Gnostic kind of Christianity, where um, we have a theology of Jesus but we don't have an anthropology of Jesus. So theology is the study of God. If you read the book of the Bible, if you read the, the Bible, you're going to get, you know, people, everyone, whether you're atheist or not, will say, yeah, this is an attempt at a study of God in this book. Um, but then you don't say it's an anthropo anthropological book, which would be the study of man, how man came to be as a, as a, as a group, as a community and as a species. Um, there's, there's, that, that's not considered. But the claim that Jesus makes more often than he makes, uh, he makes the claim that he's both son of God and son of man. And he makes the claim son of man more explicitly than he does the son of God. So if we want to take this from a, just a kind of a, taking the spiritual claim out of that sentence or, or that statement, son of God, son of God would mean he is the highest, uh, he is, he is claiming to be the highest example of what it means to be like God. He's the best representation of God and God's plan in history and God's experience in history with humans. But then the son of man part would mean that he is the highest example of what it means to be human. And what is it? What does mankind, what is mankind all about? Where did mankind come from? Where did we create our order, our, our culture, our society? So if we only have a theology of the Bible or a theology of Jesus, then we won't have a full picture of Jesus. We'll get these Cartesian type models that become these uh, these these little mythologies that we use to exclude enemy others in the name of Jesus and self-righteousness. And that's what the church has done many times. And it's not the church only. I'm just saying that because the church doesn't recognize the fullness of Jesus' claim in the anthropological dimension, it only keeps their encounter with Christ in the, the realm of ideas, the realm of propositional ascent. But if you have an anthropological approach to Jesus, as I think Girard's theory helps provide, um, then what you'll find is that it's not just about what you think. It's not just about a creedal affirmation or some kind of a doctrinal mental ascent. It's not an SAT uh, test that gets you into the kingdom of heaven, but rather it is the imitation of the person of Jesus that allows you to experience 
kind of the reality of what it means to be an, a follower of Jesus. So Gerard was a someone who converted to Christianity first from an intellectual basis, not a theological experience or a religious experience. He, con he converted to Christianity after he saw its intellectual superior, superiority. And so uh, he started with the mimetic theory being the, the, the basis of it being that humans desire what others desire, that we are a copycat species. We, we don't just borrow the uh, rote uh, behaviors uh, and uh, gestures that we see around us. We also, we borrow the desires of those we see around us. We, we borrow what they perceive that, we, we borrow what we perceive them desiring and we covet what they covet. And we covet, really, their perceived success in life based on the things that we see them having. And those things are not just objects like in property. They can also be intangible things like popularity within the social circles that you want to be esteemed by. Or they can be, you know, uh, success within a social hierarchy of a clique that you hang out with or, uh, you know, uh, you know, acclamation in your workplace or, you know, different uh, perceptions of success that many people have on a social plane, those are also, in some sense, objects that we see other people having. And we perceive that if we could have those things too, that we would have the better state of being that they, that we perceive those people around us having. So human beings we don't, we're not just walking brains on sticks and libertarian um, philosophy would do well to get out of the enlightenment bubble, which is itself a manifestation of the Christian uh, framework of, of reality, but a deviation of it a little bit. Um, the enlightenment framework is, an, it has inherited Christianity, but also goes off the rails, just like so many other epochs in human history that we're experiencing, that we've, we can look at. But the, um, we would do well to get out of this kind of rationalistic Cartesian bubble that our own Christian friends are in too, when it comes to our, our, our processing of, of what Jesus is all about. And that means getting back to uh, desire, getting back to what actually motivates human beings, which is something more guttural, which is something more in the limbic brain rather than just neocortex operations, something that's more rooted in our full being, our full, you know, our full um, kind of primordial drives of wanting to be, uh, you know, uh, what other people have and what they are. Um, so we see mimetic desire in the most fundamental things that humans do. We see it with children. The classic example a lot of mimetic theory uh, researchers point to as kind of like a way for people to understand it is, you know, you see, you know, two children in a playroom and there's uh, uh, you could have two of the same dolls in a stack of toys. And if one of the little toddlers picks up one of those dolls, the other child immediately grabs for that doll and tries to pull it away. And then the, the first toddler who picked it up was just playing with it lackadaisical at first. But now that his neighbor has desired it, it has inflamed his desire for it. And so he pulls back harder. Now he really wants it when before he just kind of picked it up and out of mild interest. Now he's, his interest has increased because he is imitating the desire of his neighbor who imitated his desire. And that back and forth ping pong of re reciprocal uh, desire and gesturing can create conflict, as we can see with a toddler screaming or maybe, you know, pushing or hitting or something. Sometimes it goes to that point before it has to be broke, you know, someone has to step in and stop it. Um, uh, I, I like to say that uh, the third part, the, the second part of Girard's grand theory, which is the idea that in order for human beings to imitate each other in a way that doesn't end in war of all against all, they have to find a third party to vent their frustrations onto together, to channel their anger and desire and and jealousy or what have you into a common direction that can unify the two people in conflict or who, however many are in the community. And to illustrate that, I can use the same toddler metaphor um, and, and say that the two kids are, are pulling hard on the same doll. There's another doll just like it in the play 
stockpile, but it doesn't matter. There's no rational reason in, in the sense of the object itself doesn't have a true intrinsic desire uh, for the, the child. It's the fact that the child wants to be like the other child and, and wants to have what they have. And then that gets resolved with maybe a, a dog comes by and wagging a little fluffy tail and both of them find pleasure pulling on the tail together and laughing when the dog uh, tries to, you know, get them off or something. And that would be a kind of a primordial level of like a scapegoat effect that that is the second great part of Girard's theory. So in mimetic theory, the first part is that humans desire what others desire and that that mimetic mimetic means imitation it's like where we get the word mime or it's, it's related to the word for meme but it is different from meme there's a meme theory that uh, that people get confused with mimetic theory and it's different but um, uh, but mimetic is 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 about desiring what our neighbors desire and then um, we go about our lives trying to create all of these artificial external uh, posturing of, of, of difference, that we are different in this and that, and we're different in this and that. But those are all ways for our, um, our selves to be able to kind of delude ourselves into, believe, into believing that we're not mostly copying what those around us um uh, like or desire or think. And then the second part of Girard's grand unified theory is that that conflict, that, that conflict that brews from having, from having contagious desires, from catching desires like we catch a cold in an airplane or something from other people coughing around us. We catch desires for scarce goods, scarce, uh, scarce uh, social statuses on hierarchies, and that, if you leave that kind of on its own, can lead to genocide and extinction of everybody because it just goes on and on and on to the point of violence and murder. And if you didn't have a way to stop that kind of contagious desire, then we wouldn't be here as a species today. And so the way that humans found a way to resolve it at the fundamental level of our our origins as a human species was that we stumbled on a way to imitate each other in a way that could uh, defer that building animosity onto a common enemy. And so if everybody's pointing fingers at everybody else because contagious aggression is spreading, then it's easy to see in a primordial sense how if everybody's pointing, copying each other's finger pointing, you can still copy each other's finger pointing as you start to point in the direction of one single enemy someone who stands out somewhat in a, in a kind of, again, arbitrary way that allows people who are caught up in a sea of mob mentality, a sea of lack of identity, a sea of sameness, that in that sea of sameness, someone who stands out in an arbitrary sense can be quickly a target for wrath and blame and accusation as the cause of the rest of the people's problems. And that person can be deformed. They could be a dwarf. They could be uh, too, too frail. They could be blind. They could be disfigured. Typically, it's someone that has a disability in the ancient times. That's why all the gods that we see in mythology walk with uh, disabilities and they have disfigurements. They have one eye. Medusa is, is ugly to look at. Uh, Oedipus Rex, Oedipus walks with a, uh, a twisted gait, and different gods have similar attributes like that that you can see in some of the earliest mythologies. So there's this pattern that the scapegoats that we select tend to be those who have a tell, something that's kind of an arbitrary standout feature that when people feel like they've lost their sense of self, they can look to that person as a community and say, that person's different. Maybe they're a tricker. Maybe they're a, a demon. Maybe they're, maybe they're the person who has stirred us all up against each other, and or you know maybe maybe they're disfigured because the gods are cursing them, or you know maybe maybe they're too. It, it could be someone who's too rich, too beautiful, uh, but it's typically got to be someone who does not have a prevailing power faction at their disposal 
to avenge the accusation and killing of them. So if you have a community, they're looking to uh, vent their anger into a common direction. They are not going to target someone who's very popular, typically, um, and uh, send all their uh, animosity towards them and lynch them and kill them or cast them off of a cliff or stone them or devour them as they did in ritual cannibalism at every level of our earliest records of human culture. They're not going to do that to somebody who's got a, a willing band of uh, defenders ready to say, uh-uh, uh-uh, this guy's not to blame for what you're doing. I mean, for the causes of our time, you know, the famine or the plague or whatever it is that's caused the pressures to build and the tensions to flare in a mimetic, uh, you know, pattern. So it's it's got to be someone who will not have a, an avenged uh, party ready to get to get back uh, payback or otherwise it would just be more reciprocal mimetic conflict, you know, between uh, rival factions. So it's got to be something that can be a unifying uh, target for the community to ostracize, blame, and everybody truly believes it. That's what's important is that the, the group think is so powerful in human nature that everybody truly believes that that person is guilty and deserving of death or uh, ostracization. And when they kill that person together, it creates a cathartic release. It creates a sense of, of ecstatic relief because before things were getting to the point where people felt like they were at their wit's end with tension and stress and paranoia between each other. Um, maybe there was a famine, you know, maybe there was a famine and food was very scarce and people were getting hungry and they were seeing people die in the village. Uh, and then all of a sudden, you know, when they're fighting and they're, and they're suspicious and they're looking for answers. And then this person over here, who's a little bit different, maybe they're bigger than everybody, or maybe they're too, they're smaller than everybody, or maybe they came from a rival tribe and they look a little bit different externally. That person, uh, they say, you know, that person did this. This is why we're feeling this pain and this stress and this anxiety. And they channel all that together and stoning that person. Now they feel relief because they feel like they did, uh, they did something together and it brought uh, a, a sense of peace and order uh, that uh, the problem, the, the cause of the problem has now been vanquished. And it's a, it's a very, very powerful and passionate and primordial experience for people to kill someone and to kill them often in a brutal way and to do it together with people who at one time were your enemies. Now you're joining together. We see this all the time, you know, think about, the, all the war campaigns today, you know, go back to World War One or World War Two or whatever, where, you know, you might have a, a, a neighbor down the street that just gets on your nerves. You can't stand them. They're of a different religion. They're of a different economic way, the different political philosophy. And you can't stand for your kids to play with their kids. And you just have this hatred and rivalry build up. And then a war breaks out and you and them go together to enlist in a war to go fight a common enemy that seeks the destruction in your mind of the whole neighborhood and everything around it. And that unifies you in that ecstatic catharsis, knowing that you're going off to destroy and vanquish a foe that means the annihilation of everything together. Well, that, that annihilation, the fear of annihilation is a real fear because they, there, there's something about contagious violence and, anxiety that feels like everybody's about to be dead. You know, everybody's about to be destroyed here. It's going to wipe out everything we have. We're not even going to have our, our village or our community anymore. But then they project that fear of annihilation onto their common foe and they make them the, 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 you know, cause of it so that when they beat that person and destroy that person, they then all mimetically as a group think, can see, can feel the feeling of, of salvation. And when you have this moment, the person who at one point was the, the demon of all the community now becomes a savior, now becomes this psychologically unifying force that resolved the tensions between mortal enemies who felt like their, 
very being was at stake if that tension wasn't able to be resolved. And so then what does, uh, you know, what do ancient communities, what do these uh, primitive societies make of this weird experience? Whereas at one point, this focus of obsession to destroy this person because they are the cause of all calamity and fear and pain or trouble. Now they are the cause of all unity and peace and order. Well, that's what we see when they tell the oral tradition to their, to their um, descendants. That's what we see that oral tradition becomes what we call mythology, where they tell these stories that in the beginning there was chaos. And out of that chaos, a god emerged and slaughtered another god or did or, or, or battled something else. And out of that, that, that killing, order was restored. Or we see stories like in the Greek, uh, the Greek mythologies of gods that were tricksters and uh, little antagonists in their earliest exploits and stories that we hear of their uh, interactions with man. But then later on, we see them acting as saviors of saving communities from destruction and plagues and famines, usually if the community provides them a sacrificial, you know, they give a sacrificial victim or, you know, do certain things that please them in a sacrificial way. They save them from a storm or save them from a, of a rival war camp, a rival uh, war, uh, uh, you know, campaign that's coming against their city. But you see that that paradox, that mercurial nature of all mythological gods, that they they're both they can destroy you with terror, but they can also save you and they can also restore everything you have. That is the hallmark of the scapegoat at the at the primordial level of scapegoat violence. They they cause they are blamed as the cause of the problems of the community. And then they are destroyed, and in their destruction, it's as if they were there to teach us a lesson all along. The, the, the story that people transmit to their children and children and children and grandchildren is that there are certain things that we need to do to prevent out-of-control mimetic desire from running amok. And those taboos are what we get with primitive religion. Don't steal, because if you steal, it's going to set off reciprocal stealing, and then the whole community is going to be inflamed in a war of all against all. You know, don't kill. You know, don't 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 take somebody else's uh, uh, partner, you know, wife or whatever, uh, because they're going to take yours, and it's going to go back and forth. It's going to create a loss of difference. So all those primordial taboos are all about uh, maintaining difference, maintaining boundaries of being so as to not unleash the terror of mimetic desire uncontrolled once people feel like they are losing their sense of self and their sense of distinctiveness and their sense of, you know, existence because of other people, you know, kind of uh, consuming and devouring everything that they felt was theirs. Um, and so that's where taboos come along to kind of reiterate the things that were the occasion for the feeling of chaos that surrounded the community when they stumbled on to a common enemy to destroy, to stop that chaos. That's where original rituals and taboos come about in primordial religion. Uh, with, and then uh, the mythology is the projection of the community violence into symbols outside of them that they call gods that they attach to forces of nature and other things that are mysterious in the world that serve as kind of conduits for understanding these psychological experiences that the community experiences when they break those taboos of difference and go into a state of undifferentiation. So the moral of the story for these, these communities all over the world is that, you know, you need to follow these taboos of of difference that are preventing us from stumbling into contagious envy and jealousy and desire. And you follow these taboos. And if you break them, it's going to unleash the wrath of the gods 
but the wrath of the gods are actually just cover, they're just they're just projections into the sky into an abstract sense what are actually just scapegoat victims which are actually just uh common enemies of a community that were selected in an almost arbitrary way to to provide relief for um contagious violence that's brewing in a community and so that that's why all of our mythologies have that kind of weird uh, interplay between um, the gods being both beneficial and salvific and, and, and saving the community and, and giving them and even birthing communities and birthing civilizations, but then also in their earliest exploits doing weird things that violate taboos of order and difference, like the, a lot of the gods are accused of being incestuous or having bestiality. You know, you get gods that are half uh, bull, half human, and half, uh, you know, horse, half human, and different beasts. Some gods have a face of a lion and an eagle and a bear all mixed in one and all these things. This is These are all symbols representing undifferentiation. And so, again, remember what I said, a scapegoat, uh, to become an effective scapegoat, they need to get, you know, the community has to convince themselves that they're the cause of the undifferentiation. They're the cause of the loss of self, the loss of boundaries of order. They're the cause of the uncontrollable uh, mixing of things into a kind of sea of sameness. And that's why you get this uh, accusation. And so, well, it's not it's not portrayed as an accusation in mythology. It's just written as so that, you know, uh, Zeus was was uh, doing incest here or this god was doing bestiality here or this thing you know this thing you know was you know all these different boundaries They're, they they sometimes they steal sometimes they take on the identity of somebody else and deceive someone but then they also save and that push pull of the gods is is really just a psychological distillation and uh symbolic representation of the uh, push-pull effect of the scapegoat, that the scapegoat uh, draws us together and unites us uh, to, uh, to basically act as a god to teach us what we have to do when we uh, feel the uh, uncontrollable uh, loss of self that mimetic desire contagiously can breed into when we're not careful about following taboos of difference. So with uh, does that right, make sense? By the way, that yes, no, 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 absolutely. And you know, this this remind me of the uh, a while back I'd read a Hero of a Thousand Faces by you know Joseph Campbell and um, you know, George Fraser uh, as well. He was a, an anthropologist. Um, they formulated this kind of this concept that's that's somewhat similar but very different. Uh, that throughout history, cultures and societies, they develop these common myths with common elements, themes, whatever. And Campbell kind of went a step further, saying that there's a universal myth that's continually repeated, that's retold throughout all cultures in a different form. But the, the you know, the, what he called basically or would say was the same story with just a, a different actors. And I, I was wondering if you could maybe uh, clarify um, although it's probably a little bit obvious just to, to, to many of the listeners, but how Gerard's uh, mimetic theory differs from from someone like Campbell or Fraser, who identify these common quote unquote myths, um, whereas Gerard's kind of goes in a in a, in a much more um, uh, intellectual, or I shouldn't say intellectual, but a much better direction, I think, than than Campbell or Fraser. Well, I, uh, you can see a contrast between Gerard and, say, a Campbell with like a, like Cam Campbell will take a story like like a, the story of like a, a community that does a ritual where they take two young teenagers and they put them in a shack as a rite of passage ritual. And uh, then they uh, they do all kinds of rituals and rites around that shack and then they kill that those teenagers or they burn the shack or something like that. And uh, it's what Campbell will do is he'll say, well, look, look how this is, this is connected to the harvest season and how this is a, this is a ritual that is uh, universal to cultures who are looking to 
uh, you know, make meaning about the, the changing of seasons and fertility and the values that are there. And what Gerard would do is say, but you're missing the elephant in the room, which is why are they killing these teenagers? You know, why are they why are they selecting these teenagers in this ritual and then killing them? What what that the kill is the is the real huge thing there. And uh, that that those killing rituals that you find them in all ancient, you know, uh, ritual religions. And that's the fundamental that's the fundamental heart of the mythologies that accompany them. Right. And so when you when you take them and you say and you m diminish the scapegoat mechanism phenomena and just say, well, these are just stories that are meant to to give humans uh, fantasy and, and give them a sense of meaning for storms and make them uh, feel a sense of belonging and, and you know, all that stuff. But they don't want to really touch the real core. They, they want to keep the corpse of humanity hidden. Right. And that's what Jesus said when he said, I've come to reveal things hidden since the foundation of the world, that even our current modern ideologies, as sophisticated as they think they are, are doing the same thing that ancient mythologies did, which is to conceal the corpse of the human species at all costs, to hide the victim so as to not allow us to confront the ugly truth of where we came from anthropologically speaking, and where we're still trying to uh, practice these rituals and justifications for might makes right and sacrificial violence and coercion and domination and all the things that we do in the modern world, which are just religious vestiges of these, of these, this, this universal practice of humankind since the dawn of recorded history and before that. So, uh, you know, the difference with Gerard, you know, again, is you know the dying and rising savior myth. Um, again, I mean, you can you, you can see the pattern of the scapegoat right there. You know, it's die. They, you know, there's a there's a uh, you know a, a hero and they have to fight the dragon. What's the dragon? The dragon in the in the real sense is the the community's uh, undifferentiated chaos. Um, the the community is in a state of chaos. It's going to lose its sense of existence is it might extinguish itself and that's the dragon in some sense and the hero is presented to fight the dragon and in the fight he dies and then he he is reborn well what's the re what's the rebirth of the hero the rebirth of the hero is the fact that after they kill that hero the community then feels as if that hero's spirit lives within all of them now they reinterpret the irrational ecstasy of the experience of common of a common lynching that uh, restored order and now they tell the story as well that hero was reborn in all of us and that hero becomes our 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 patron god our tribal leader our hero that will 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 bring us through any time of, of turmoil as long as we sacrifice god, uh, humans in his honor so it's a god, the gods are victims themselves who are demanding more victims to be fed to them to keep the engine of community intact. Does that make sense? Yes. No. No. Absolutely, it does. Yeah, it's it's fascinating stuff. So I mean, the, the point is, is that the only way to have uh, to be a true atheist is to follow Jesus. <laughs> People don't want to hear that. <coughs> Excuse me. They don't want to hear that because. You know, we all want to believe that uh, we're autonomous little individuals that, you know, <clears throat> we want a Jaguar because we just want one objectively, uh, you know, not because the neighbor across the street or down in the nicer neighborhood has one. We want the accolades just because we like the accolades, not because we feel like that will give us a sense of peace and satisfaction in the heart of our being that we perceive others who get accolades and cheers from the crowd get. We, we all, we tell all these little convenient self mythologies to justify us blindly being pulled here and there with role models all around us, whether we read them in a book, like, uh, uh, you know, the uh, Cervantes and the, uh, the, uh, what's the story? The, um, of the uh, Don Quixote. Don Quixote is someone who loves the King Arthur uh, romantic novel of the of the chivalry and the knightly honor, 
And so he lives his whole life uh, in imitation of an external role model that is someone in a book from far a long time ago who he can become and find his sense of being and, and, and satisfaction in that. And then we have internal role models, which are people who are more closer to home. Could be your uh, parent who doesn't want to see you succeed or surpass them because they kind of want to keep you down under their thumb because that makes them feel like they're still successful if they can work that out. Or maybe it's a, um, uh, you know, a, 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 a friend at work who, you guys love the same things, but at some point it turns into rivalry because, uh, you know, you're fighting for the same position at work and uh, your character qualities are kind of similar to the people on the outside. And then you have to try to emphasize the differences between each other. But on the outside, people say, well, it looks like these guys are just squabbling, you know, over the same stuff. I can't see the difference. Uh, internally, you guys feel like you're farther apart than ever. Outside of it, everybody thinks you look like a Looney Tunes cloud. You know those Looney Tunes cloud when you have the uh, two characters fight and they get into a little dust cloud and then Bugs Bunny will come out of the dust cloud and the dust cloud still fighting. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's mimetic desire in the sense that, you know what I mean, from the out front, it's like, you know, you have a conflict. Uh, two characters get into a fight, Bugs Bunny and whoever, and it turns into a dust cloud. You can't tell who's who anymore. You just see a little hair, a little arm, and it's just a cloud. And that's supposed to represent the loss of self between uh, two rivals. And then Bugs Money will come out of that dust cloud of fight. And the fight's still going, but there's only one guy in there. <laughs> so it shows you the undifferentiation because it's kind of pointing at it like, what's the point? You know, it's, it's just a, a loss of sameness over there. He doesn't even know who he's hitting anymore. He's just hitting himself. Uh, and that's the kind of uh, wink to the audience that these little stories and ch childhood uh, characters can, can reveal to us the most profound things uh, right under our noses. But, you know, that's what all modern ideology is really just a continuation of the concealment of the hidden victims of our of our collective sense of being and order. And that's what we're struggling with today with understanding the state. And it's not just the state, it's any group. I mean, you can have, you know, you can have a vegan clique that excludes people who eat uh, eggs and they're vegetarian guys. You got to really exclude them like they violated a sacred taboo of, of unity by eating eggs so they get ex they get excluded and they uh you could have a ketogenic group that excludes people who eat you know more than 100 carbs or something you know or something like that uh there's always we all have this predilection for forming a community that's based on the ritual expulsion of people who violate the taboos that everybody shares adherence to and the reason why i think that they have to do this is because you know, within a community that's undifferentiated, let's say everybody in a community of veganism, they all eat the same particular way of veganism. There's all kinds of philosophies. Let's say there's a particular type of group and they have a very specific protocol within that adherence to the whole lifestyle package that comes with that. That's a loss of self. Right. And so within that loss of self environment, there is a lot of opportunity for contagious envy and aggression and resentment and anxiety to to foment because we fight because we're the same, not, because, not that we're different, but it's in that tension of loss of self that order is restored by finding people within the community who have violated one of the taboos of difference that we do not eat eggs here, or we do not eat fish and they're eating fish and they need to be shunned because they're trying to push the idea that we need to eat fish for some vitamins or something like that, then they have to be shunned out of the community in order to restore this sense of unifying uh, order that the uh, group think uh, maintains in their transcendent values that keep them glued together. That's what religion is. That's what communities are. By the way, that's what all fields of knowledge operate under. That's why, you know, if someone tries to do something different, and uh, they say, you know, like Stanley Pons and Martin Fleischman in 1989 came out with this so-called cold fusion experiment. And again, whether there's anything to it or not, there was an immediate crisis, uh, a sacrificial crisis that opened up because all of a sudden when uh, 
you know, someone challenges the foundations of knowledge that binds the whole community together, that's a violation of the sacred dogmas and taboos that makes nuclear physics or chemistry in the, in the related fields that were being, uh, you know, brought into this, this announcement for cold fusion, that makes them have a crisis of identity. And so they have to bind themselves together by shunning these people to the point where uh, Stanley Pons fled to France and to this day will not come back into America or do any interviews because of how ugly he was treated just because he came up with this uh, insight that you could have room temperature uh, nuclear energy reactions. And uh, many people apparently have been replicating that work through the years quietly in Japan and United States and other places. But it's still that field has never, that field of research and inquiry has never fully recovered from the stigma of the scapegoat shunning hysteria that happened uh, with uh, Martin Fleischman and Stanley Pons when they did the cold fusion thing. So what happened was, you know, they had to be shunned. They had to be excommunicated because they, they, they triggered the sense of the, the sacred boundaries of what it means to be nuclear physics. Uh, they said, you know, nuclear fusion has to have a certain, uh, certain factors. It has to have a certain environmental uh, situation for it to occur, occur. And this was something that was laid in the foundations of the standard model and, and all these other things. And then here comes these, one of the, uh, you know, some of the best chemical, I think Martin Fleischman was one of the highest uh, chemical engineers in the world you know, these are the top of their top, but they, they, they went above their hierarchy. So they violated the taboo of order, which means a chemist is making claims about physics. So now he's gone above because in the hierarchy of the scientific world, uh, new, you know, physics would be at the higher level than chemistry. And here, here are these chemical genius, chemistry geniuses making a pronouncement about so-called fusion. Now they have violated the taboo of the hierarchy of the, of the community. And so the way you uh, the way you uh, reinforce and restore order of that hierarchy is that you excommunicate, you destroy, you denounce, you vilify the person who got out of line and tried to make a pronouncement about what's possible with fusion without having the you know the 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 rank to make such a claim. And so they're destroyed and eliminated. And um, that field has still got the taboo that has left that that that, that trail of, of uh, shame was left with, but it, it's still per percolating that whole field. But my point is just to show you that I can show you veganism fans, I can show you keto fans, I can show you scientific community, I can show you how this group dynamic uh, operates on the same religious groupthink characteristics of shared catharsis, of shared rituals, and then the need to maintain that boundary of, of order by uh, eliminating people and socially destroying people who challenge the sacred perimeters of what makes that order bound together. Well, I don't know if you're familiar with John Verveke at all. I, I've seen a couple clips from okay. his work, and uh, a few people have referenced his work. To yeah, it, Paul Vanderclay. Yeah, I I had uh, interviewed him a while back on on episode forty seven. His contention is that I think that he's he's right, and he's very uh, like he's spot on in in recognizing the symptom, and you know this fits in perfectly with with Gerard's um, uh, mimetic theory. I think that he. That Verveke, uh, he uh, identifies the symptom, and he is himself like, in, in as well as that, is trying to develop kind of basically a secular alternative, I guess, if you want to call it to that. But his um, main contention is that these, especially in the Western world, as we've moved away from you know since the Enlightenment, really, since uh, a move away from uh, religious institutions as a as a purveyor of meaning right as as finding meaning in your life um um through faith uh and in more modern history it's really accelerated to the point now where it's even fraternal organizations things like that are all gone or dying um uh, uh, very very rapidly like you don't see a lot of young people in uh at like the elks club or whatever right uh for, for the most part and what he's saying is that this is why you see all these 
issues in society. You see, you know, increased rates of suicide, drug use, um, just all these kind of, you know, mass shootings could could also be uh, considered one of the, you know, these things, even though like the numbers are, are really not as crazy as as they'll put out in the news. Uh, but these are symptoms of of people who feel hopeless, of people who feel they have no meaning in life, because when you have a established meaning in your life, you have a reason why you get up in the morning. You have a reason why you're doing whatever it is that you're doing every day um, and a, a thing to be moving uh, forward to, a, a thing you're trying to emulate um, and and you know model your life after. Uh, but Well, that, one of the reasons those mass shootings happen is because, you know, you look at those movies that Hollywood produces where they encourage people to be a hero by gunning down everybody, you know, and uh, – uh, you know, I, that was that clip from the Kingsman where the guy, have you seen that movie where there's a scene where he goes yep. into a church setting and just shoots everybody over and over and over again? You know, it's really repulsive to think about that. But, you know, I mean, you know, these kids that are disaffected, they see that and they say, you know, look at the glory of that, you know, and I'm, 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 a, I'm on the low end of the hierarchy. I'm the lowest of the low in my high school and my whatever uh, whether they're a rich kid or what, maybe their mom or dad barely gives them any quality time and treats them with the respect they feel they deserve not to be treated like a child or something. And so, you know, they, they go and they nurse this resentment and they feel like, well, I have the right to move up on the hierarchy. I mean, look at this movie star. He gets to get millions of dollars. And so that's mimetic desire unleashed, right? They're looking at that and say, he, they get to have the glory. They get to have millions of dollars, all the women, the yacht, the, the trips to every fine hotel you can imagine, the finest food. And he gets to pretend to, to shoot down people in the most brilliant way. Why can't I do that? These people around me in my class, they're they're awful, they're fake or whatever, they're, they're dumb, whatever their little motivation is for justifying the dehumanization of their classmates. And so they want revenge. They want uh, it's a revenge, a revenge of the scapegoat. They perceive themselves to be unjustly uh, marginalized and treated as an outcast. So it's the revenge of the scapegoat. Um, this is a purely modern phenomenon because the, you didn't have revenge of the scapegoat uh, narratives happening in the ancient world. And the reason why we have this narrative is because Christianity broke the ancient world's mythological frame of reality. And we're dealing with the pieces and shards of it today. Um, and so that's why uh, someone who's on the lowest of the low hierarchy, hierarchical structure, like an outcast in school, feels like they have the ability to rise up and get their moment of TV glory, just like the movie stars and TV stars. And then you add to that the uh, the media's uh, 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 and the government's whole uh, love affair with perpetual violence. You know, I mean, we've got to have a law to get the rich tax. Well, taxation and using taxation to punish certain peoples is a kind of a violent way of trying to say we're going to bring someone down by force when we get the numbers on our side to get our people in power and then use that power of the state to bear down on the on the backs of the crooked rich or the crooked these groups or that group and then you have the whole force of uh you know um you know uh, punch a nazi and all this stuff that's always percolating anybody who's not a radical marxist is by definition a a, a nazi collaborator and therefore they need to be uh dehumanized and hit and hurt and, and hit their brain, you know, with their punch to the face so that you cause their brain to have concussions and contusions and what have you. This is disgusting, but that kind of sacrificial violent language is all in our society. And um, it's always masked in the self-righteousness of the victim, because again, it's mimicking the framework of Christianity because Christianity says uh, the, the victim is where God stands. And so we we have uh, thrown out the word God, but we're still doing the same thing. But we're doing it by trying to reinsert violence back into uh, the Christian framework by saying, uh, well, uh, I get to kill or I get to destroy uh, the this enemy group by getting political power uh, because we're the victims or we're the allies of the victims and therefore we deserve vengeance. And that's the really, that's the big thing that Nietzsche was identifying before his time. And he knew Christianity was the reason why that resentment was building, that resentment was building on such a deep level 
that uh, would be very dangerous once the, the notion of the old God was finally put to, uh, you know, mainstream consciousness uh, to death in that mainstream way that we would be uh, flailing about for resentment and this idea that people who in the ancient world would be just brutalized and shut down and had no place and no storytelling in pop culture that said they as a loser could move up the hierarchy uh, that has totally dissolved in the in the light of Christianity's impact in the West. And so now everybody feels if they're marginalized as a victim, that they have a self-righteous fervor to use sacrificial violence against their oppressors. And that's what that mass shooting phenomenon is about, mimetically trying to one-up the last scapegoat or wannabe scapegoat guy or whatever who shoots people uh, to get revenge on the on the on the community for not exalting them as the victim par excellence, right? So they, they become, they feel like they can become a little TV made for TV God in their ability to murder people in that way. So it, it's a very Girardian mimetic phenomenon, very, very much so. Uh, but, you know, this is something that, you know, have you seen that, have you seen the Gothard uh, tunnel opening ceremony by chance? I, I have not. That was a, a big tunnel opening that they opened in the uh, Swiss uh, mountain region. That was a, it, it's, it's open now. It's this big tunnel that connects the whole EU spine and that Swiss uh, mountain region. And it, uh, it um, uh, was an interesting ceremony. I, I, I encourage people to look it up. It's, uh, I want to make sure I'm saying it right. The, uh, I think it's Gothard or Gothard or Gothard, uh, Swiss tunnel. And it's, uh, I encourage you to look at the presentation that they, they do a few different rituals, uh, in the different, uh, dramas. But one of the things that's interesting about it is that it's a, uh, it was a railway tunnel through the Alps, uh, opened in 2016, June 1st. And, uh, it, it's the world's longest railway in the deepest traffic tunnel in the first flat low level route through the Alps. And all the major, you know, globalists and heads of state and everybody were in attendance to these little plays they did to commemorate the opening of the tunnel. Um, and what was interesting about it was that in the, uh, in the uh, play, they have a situation where they have a goat demon come out who represents a, a legend of a kind of a satanic goat figure in ancient Swiss legend and mythology of that mountain pass area. And this goat uh, character at one point has to claim the souls of some workers who die in the construction of the tunnel, right? And so these tunnel, it shows these construction workers working on this tunnel, and then it shows them die, and it shows their little spirits go, and then it shows this, this goat demon kind of bear down on them, almost in like a marriage ceremony of claiming these souls as his, as a way of making the tunnel uh, kind of blessed to be open. So what's interesting about that is that in the uh, tunnel construction, several workers actually died in the making of the tunnel. I'm actually looking you, at the, do you follow what I'm saying? Yeah, no, uh, I, I was, I was Googling this while you were, while you were speaking as well. And there it is. Yeah. Nine people died during the construction. Right? Yeah. So these nine people were represented in the play that people like Angela Merkel and everybody was watching as this goat demon, like bore down on these people's spirits and represented as actors and construction workers in the construction yeah, of, the, okay. of the tunnel. So here we have these people are blatantly kind of uh, celebrating in, I think, a most ugly fashion, right? Because these are people, these are real people who died. Nine people died during the construction of this tunnel for this globalist EU glory to unite the European Union with the trade and everything they're going to do there. And they use those people's death and symbolize them with construction workers being almost as sacrificial tokens for this Baphomet or some kind of goat-like demon figure to consume for his glory in order to kind of bless the passage 
uh, in its ability to happen. Now, isn't that a little bit offensive to you to think that, that the, the heads of the states and businesses of the world's biggest corporations involved were kind of enjoying this kind of drama and there's nobody talking about how, how offensive it is to represent actual people dying as being consumed as sacrificial fodder for some kind of God character. Isn't that weird? Yeah. Yeah. Very much so. <laughs> exactly. So that's there right in the open. Right. And so what's interesting about it to me is um, there's an ancient story of uh, a Christian legend that uh, Satan appeared as this goat like demon in that same pass. The Gothard base tunnel is built near where he would say, you can come across, the, he told the community, and I, and I don't remember all the details, but basically something to the effect of, you can come across this mountain pass, but you have to uh, uh, offer the life of a human in order to pass. I mean, or, or you, you have to offer uh, the life of the, of the first to come across the path. And I believe the the Christian in the Christian legend, instead of sending a human, they send a goat and he has to kill the goat as his sacrifice. That's all he gets. And it's like a trickery of the devil there. So it's kind of like, so you see, you see, you see how the Christian community, their legends are kind of, again, think of it like a fossil record of storytelling. They're repudiating the old sacrificial order that used to be the domain of the gods and has now been relegated to the domain of Satan, the enemy, right? And the, and the enemy is now this adversarial entity outside of the community, not the god reigning over the community. And he still demands human flesh, but because they're Christians, they're not going to offer human flesh. They're going to offer a goat to, to kind of trick him in his little tricks. So it's still still kind of sacrificially connected to the older world of the Swiss pagan culture that was there before it became Christianized. It's, it's got a, it's got a, it's got a, it's got a connection in its DNA to that tradition of that community, but it's, it's a renunciation of human sacrifice. But in this new, this new dramatic play of this new Gothard tunnel, it's a, it's an attempt to reverse the Christian renunciation of human sacrifice and to celebrate it in the public square in front of all these heads of state who are clapping and cheering on this symbolic play that represents the values of the, of the EU and, and globalism. And it's, it, it's just very interesting to me how, you know, that stuff is, is kind of coming back. It's almost like the pagan sacrificial mythological order of the ancient world is almost bubbling up to the point where, uh, you know, it wants to be celebrated in the public square that it's OK to treat human life as a as a token sacrifice for some kind of uh, God that demands it for the glory of the tunnels construction. And I bring that up to make a point, which is that this is nothing new. Every ancient community has what we call a foundation sacrifice uh, where they would lay uh, victims, uh, sometimes alive, sometimes killed already, into a groove for the cornerstone to be laid at the beginning of a new uh, temple or a new wall or fortress or dam or bridge construction or, you know, anything just like this Gothard tunnel. And so you would lay down a victim as a cornerstone blessing for the construction of the new complex or the new town or what have you. So in Japan, you know, there's stories of like, you know, uh, there's a raging river and the uh, uh, people, the army's trying to pass and it's so bad. Some of them get killed and swept away. And so they end up having to take a uh, young woman and sacrifice her in the bed of the, of the, uh, of the river and then once they did that, the Japanese legend says they were able to build the, the uh, bridge and tame the river uh, after they gave a blessing to uh, the gods or whatever of the river by sacrificing a human being. And that, again, is, again, a, a uh, repetition of the sacrificial violence of the scapegoat mechanism at the heart of all human society and culture. And so that's that sacrificial practice of laying a cornerstone ritual ceremony uh, is everywhere. We find it in ancient, you know, 
Mexico and the things, they're, they're uncovering these things all the time where they find victims hidden in the first stone laid in the construction of a great project. So, I mean, what they're doing in this Gothard Tunnel ceremony in 2016, you know, the, the director or whatever had a very keen, it seems like, or maybe they didn't, I don't know, but it's very, very uh, similar to the the glory of the ancient world, how they found meaning was through, uh, you know, immolating a victim or um, entombing them inside of a, of a, of a wall. Sometimes this happened everywhere. And uh, this is what was going on around the uh, time of the ancient Israelites. And that's why, you know, what's so radical about the old Testament is that it's showing you the vestiges of this behavior, but it's also showing that humanity is being called out of human sacrifice and, and towards living among themselves and living among each other without having to have a human sacrifice to bind each other together. I keep using the word bind together because that's the Latin root for the word religion. And that's what that, that binding together, that social psychological uh, order that we find by, you know, offering up someone, a misfit, uh, a king who's been too powerful too long, you know, like the French Revolution uh, you know, chopping the heads off of the elites. Those are sacrificial victims too, even though they may see to be, to be a scapegoat just for clarification doesn't mean you're wholly innocent of everything. It just means that you're not truly to blame for the community's full problems that, the, that you may have done things too that were bad, but you are not the, 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 the cause of the problems that are festering within a community that, uh, well, I was going to say in a modern sense, right, that we use the political process as scapegoating. You know, we they talk about the mandate of a, of a president or a Congress. And if you don't like that, you know, if you're not happy or pleased with the direction it's going, then you scapegoat that, that the current president and say, we don't like the way the economies or the country's going. And then right. we, you know, we show we, we and they they may be responsible for some of it they may not be responsible for other right. parts of it but then we just use them as a blank slate to say from here on out we are we are going to uh, uh choose a different person to to be the exactly. sacrificial king exactly yes that's precisely right so that's what presidents and politicians serve as their scapegoats and see a lot of libertarians and stuff they don't like that right because they're like wait a second those are the bad guys it's like but well, that's kind of like if you think that then you're still fully status than you even realize. You know what I mean? It's like you don't fully get the full effect of how the state operates. You know what I'm saying? And so you're right. It's it's a very good point that, that the purpose of a politician is to serve as a scapegoat misdirection conduit. They're meant to channel up all the tensions that we're feeling amongst each other, whether they're born of real injustice or they're also born of just envy and jealousy and covetousness and unsatisfaction with our place in life. And we bottle all that cauldron up that we have towards each other. And then when whoever is in office and things need to get the crowd, you know, fervor channeled against, they dump it all on this person and say, dump Trump, you know, or whatever. You know, they have to dehumanize him. They call him 45 because they don't want to dignify him with President Trump. They call him orange man to dehumanize the fact that he has garish hair classic scapegoat you know scapegoats stand out their hair is too long it's too weird they've got a gimp a, a limp leg they've got a, a disfigurement they've they've got a weird walk they've got two long legs they got uh, you know one eye of cyclops whatever it is so he's got the garish hair he's heavy set so they they make fun of him for that a lot of last presidents weren't that heavy uh, so he stands out there he's too rich and he's proud of it so he stands out there you're supposed to get success in modern Western world by pretending that you're not rich or that you're ashamed of your wealth, <laughs> you know, and that's the way you're supposed to do it. in the, uh, in the victim concerned world that we live in because of the cross. Uh, so yeah, politicians are scapegoats. Trump is the most, is the most scapegoated of the politicians that we have today. And that doesn't mean that he's the best. It just means that he is the one who has violated the taboos of what the mythology of political uh, state craft should look like in the West. And it's because he claims to be a winner when you're supposed to pretend to be a loser in order to gain power in the West. And so that makes him a throwback to a Nietzsche type because Nietzsche was all about, we're the winners 
and Christianity has unleashed this slave morality where the little guy thinks he's got dignity and the little guy should be squashed by the beautiful people and the rich people and the elites. The Dionysian cult should be the way we go back to things. That's the only way to make the world function. That's the only way to keep things going and keep the lights on. That's what Nietzsche was basically getting at in, in, in those writings about the slave morality. And, uh, and, and, and now, you know, that's what, that's what Trump's kind of becoming a scapegoat for because he never says, you know, loser language. He says, I'm a winner. I'm the best. I did this because I'm a brilliant person. I'm a genius. I made more money than you even know, you know, and that's winner's language. That's Nietzschean style language inside of a world, which is very victim concerned, which is very Marxist, you know, in terms of its, uh, uh, posturing of victimization to gain power over another. So he's not, he, he is the, the number one threat about Trump is because he challenges the sacred taboos of what binds the state cult together in the, in America and the West. He challenges the narrative. He doesn't actually change the policy much, but what's more important than the policy and the power and the coercion and all that is the narrative that we tell ourselves because all of our politicians reinforce it by all posturing as victims in various ways and clean language and victim concern language for uh, war. You know, if we're going to fight a war, it's because the poor little children that Assad's destroyed, not because we want to make money off of his oil fields. We're going to Iraq is because of the poor little children that Baghdad, that uh, Saddam Hussein is destroying, not because it's a strategic location and it helps our allies uh, in Saudi Arabia and, and so forth, and it makes us a lot of money for our military industrial contract friends. You can't say that stuff. And Trump says he, he violates the mythology of the politically correct language. So here's something to take away that mythology still exists in broken and more concealed forms because it hides itself with abstract and ideological language that makes it seem modern and not religious. And then it also hides itself in political correctness and proper speech because it's almost like we get caught up in this, this suspension of disbelief when we have a president like Barack Obama or something who says, we're going to, you know, go to Libya because we got to save the people from Gaddafi's brutality, right? And and so we we listen to that. He's using all the right language. He's smooth. He 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 presents the the position of a of an identity that is on the side of victims. And so we say, okay, we believe this story script. Go ahead and sell us. Go ahead and sell us. And and, and even it didn't even work that well, right? Because that's the thing is that. These these attempts to use sacred violence or sacrificial violence or scapegoating, whatever word you want to use there, uh, they don't work in light of Christianity because Christianity and the story of Jesus in the Gospels reveals the processes of the scapegoat mechanism and it reveals systematically the concealment that is in dying and rising savior myths and mythology and it, it reveals it from within by taking on the form and structure of those processes, but allowing you to see it from the vantage point of the person being persecuted by the winners of history. But this time, because they persecute Jesus, they're no longer the winners of history. And ever since then, wherever the story of Jesus' story, wherever Jesus' story goes in the world, it infects their mythological storytelling ability. And it breaks down their ability to get things done through the scapegoat mechanism process of sacrificial violence. And so that's why hierarchies are falling apart, particularly in the West, because the West has had the longest uh, bout of Christian infection into its sense making than, than the other communities that sometimes had Christianity come earlier on, but then it got stamped out because of the presence of another uh, religion or ideology that, that, that took hold afterwards. But Christianity has had the longest continuous infection in the Western frame that we have, and therefore we are the ones who are most haunted by victim concern. And this is all predicted by Jesus, by the way, in his, tell, in his teachings. He's, he talks about all the time the idea that, you know, mother will fight against daughter and so on. You know, families will break up against each other. That's what's happening in the West. And he said it because 
he's basically predicting that we're as he comes in and brings a new paradigm of anti-mythology, which is what the gospel stories are, um, he does so in a way that it's going to be hard for us to humble ourselves as a human species and renounce the scapegoating violence. And because we don't want to do it, we keep reinserting attempts at sacrificial violence in failingly, increasingly failing ways. It doesn't bind us together anymore. Remember the importance of sacred, sacrificial violence in the primordial past was that it bound us together, it prevented us from contagiously envying one another to the point where we're obsessed with destroying each other rather than just getting on with life. And so it's, it's, like, it's like sacred violence and the scapegoat mechanism was almost like training wheels for the human species. It was our, it was our baby food, if you want to use that. It was the bumpers of our bowling game, right? You know, you can bowl the game without worrying about failing. And now those bumpers are off. The training wheels are off. We're off of the baby food. And now we have to sink or swim. <laughs> That's the bottom line. Well, would you, I mean, maybe, you know, I was going to say it's ironic, but maybe maybe you, you, you don't view it as such. Um, but I'll just frame it that way, I guess. Anyways, uh, it, it does seem ironic in that as, um faith in Christianity in the West is on a precipitous decline um, compared to, say, 100, 200, 300 years ago, that you are seeing the kind of the, 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 the mimetic end effect of this, of the theology infection um, throughout the West kind of, I guess, chickens coming home to roost as far as for um, it, it's it's outcomes. I mean, do you do you think that's correlated, um, and an, and kind of like a natural evolution of of the the the, the Christian mimetic thought process in the society, or do you think that that's it, it's somewhat unrelated to it, and that would happen regardless of it? I think Christianity predicts its own demise. So I think this is kind of the process that it kind of predicted would happen. Um, it's a kill the messenger effect. Uh, and it's also because, uh, as I alluded to at the beginning of this discussion, that, uh, you know, the church and the institutional representation of Jesus in the community has failed to fully account for what the true implications of imitating Jesus look like. It means nonviolence. It means non-aggression. It means non-vengeance. There is a place I think you can make for some type of self-defense. You know, I don't think it's against the Christian image. I don't think it's against the imitation of the person of Jesus. And if you see a little old lady being accosted by violent assaulters in the middle of the street and you have the means to defend her, that you come in there and you break it up and you restrain those people. And physically, you know, if you have to take them down and hold them in a lock until somebody can call the whatever authorities or whatever to get the situation resolved, uh, you know, I don't think that's immoral on a Christian level. And I don't think there's any case for that. But I do think that it's immoral to initiate violence, right? So the non-aggression principle of libertarianism gets uh, part of Christianity right. It just there's just more to it than that. It's not just non-aggression; it's non-vengeance. So, and uh, that vengeance part is something that doesn't have to be just a physical violence. It can also be just you know vengeance for you know look, I want liberty and freedom and free markets, but I gotta vote this time because I gotta punish the liberals really bad time because they've been hurting me they've been destroying my communities destroying my schools destroying you know so we got to get that vengeance in there you know that vengeance mentality is what perpetuates uh this 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 uh difficult situation that we're going to increasingly be in because we're in a in a post-sacrificial order that's still trying to use sacrifice so uh yeah i mean again another thing is is that when you say christian theology is on the decline again i don't don't really take that seriously uh because um People just mimic whatever other people say. So, you know, the, the smartest people of the room of the last century in pop culture and in and, and, and conversations were all saying that they were atheist or agnostic, scientific minded people. So that's the, the religion du jour that still kind of dominates what people think is fashionable to say that you believe. And so people mimetically are adopting the language of, oh, I'm not religious. It's not because they've had some big concrete transformation away from uh, some of the metaphysical claims of Christianity, but rather they're just trying to fit in with who they believe uh, society has presented to them as the smartest people in the room. And those are the scientific 
click and all of your things. But notice that the scientific community is wrong on so many things and will be increasingly exposed to such the more we can actually start to think scientifically. The only way we're able to think scientifically in the true sense of the word is with the practice of Christianity more and more being properly applied to the structures of knowledge that we have taken for granted as dogmatic, uh, axiomatic truths that underpin our our sense of, of, of meaning in this world. What I am suggesting very clearly is that maybe the foundations of our of our uh, esteemed bodies of knowledge like physics and things like that and nutrition, uh, chemistry have a lot of foundational errors that we miss precisely because we don't understand the power of mimetic groupthink in allowing us to take on faith the established uh, doctrines and paradigms that are are, that we've inherited from past generations of people who say this is the law of gravity and this is what it looks like and this is the standard model and this is quantum physics and there is no question when you're a scientist going into the quantum physics field to be able to challenge the very foundations of quantum physics rather you inherit the fundamentals of it this is what Thomas Kuhn the scientific philosopher talks about philosophy of science Thomas Kuhn and the paradigm shift theory that he developed the average scientist does not go into the field questioning the very foundations and presuppositions of the body of knowledge that he is going to be studying. He takes it on a leap of faith and he, he assumes the foundations are correct and that he works on developing the parameters and expanding the boundaries of the research of his inherited paradigm. This is, I hate to say it, it's called religion because religion means to bind together. What binds the community together in the field of this field of science or that field of science is the inherited dogmas that they've inherited from their uh, uh, people who've come before them. Whether those things are right or not, those things are inherited. And the, the, the Kuhnian paradigm shift that Thomas Kuhn talks about, which happens when enough anomalies pile up about a reigning paradigm of knowledge that one needs to have a revolutionary moment to shift to a whole new body of of knowledge to understand the new anomalies that are discrediting the old one, that that process is retarded because of the presence of government monopolization of funding and, and uh, research that happens in these fields of knowledge, like nutrition science, like uh, chemistry, like nuclear engineering, like physics and all these other things that we we don't know what we don't know. We don't know how much how many secrets of nature are still right under our noses. And we have this bias that we'll just trust the experts that, you know, I don't know, I'll just throw out something like anti-gravity is not real because the experts figured it out. How do you know that? How do you know they've even researched it to the point where they're looking for the answers that might actually, that they're asking the questions that might actually present answers right under their noses. We don't understand how mimetic human beings are, even the ones who we perceive to be the smartest in the room of our society. So this idea that Christian metaphysics is, in the, is on the decline, I think it's a mimetic phenomenon. It's not really grounded in anything, in tan, anything tangible about, you know, something we've inherited that the others didn't know. Because we're more, Again, in the real sense of the word, religious than ever, we're religious whenever we have people like Elizabeth Warren presented to us on CNN in the backdrop of it at their climate change uh, debate. And it's a globe and she's in front of it all. And she's talking about how she's going to grab the power of the economy and move it towards clean energy to avert apocalypse. This is sacrificial language. This is the same rainmaking ritual brouhaha that we've been seeing since the primordial times of our past. So it's nothing new. It's all religion. It's all it's all leaps of faith. It's all transcendent attempts at trying to create catharsis. But it increasingly fails. It fails to unite. That's why we can see it for what it is. The problem is, of course, that we see scapegoating happening all the time now in our society. But we don't have an ability to renounce the violence as, as a group community. We, we keep clinging to our type of self-justification and our violence and our fervor against our enemy. And the, and, the, and the Jesus story is simply renounce your prerogative to initiate violence, renounce your prerogative to respond in vengeance, let go of envying your neighbor, stop believing that the desires that you think are pulling you towards 
the lifestyles that you think are beautiful. Maybe it's all an illusion. Maybe the grass is not greener on the other side. Christianity gives you the full framework of wisdom and intelligence to be able to solve problems that really matter for your everyday life. And it's the place where we've had the scientific revolution begin was because of, of people that stopped burning witches. You know, Christianity softened even the you know, the, the, the scapegoat mechanism to the point where we were able to discover the scientific uh, method because we had time to think of other alternatives other than violence to solve our problems. So when everybody's thinking, hey, there's a disease in the community, let's burn this witch, she caused it. Everybody's like, yeah, sounds good to me. I think she did. And they all mimetically, scientifically at the time believe that's to be the, the true case of the cause of the disease. They burn the person. But then there's a little bit of a feeling that's not quite as satisfying as it used to be, you know. And then they start to think, you know, I don't know if we're going to do that next time. And then somebody says, you know what, maybe there's another alternative to what causes this disease. Maybe we need to wash our freaking hands a little bit more uh, when we use the restroom. Or maybe we need to to look at what that bacteria, what, what does that look right there? Is that, a, is that a culture of bacteria growing on that man's uh, face right there? Let's check a look at that and see what that is. Then you say, well, how do I see that? So you, you figure out mirrors and you figure out, uh, you know, pieces of glass that amplify the, the image so you can see it better. And then you start to rip it, repeat that mimetically in a positive way. And then you get scientific development. So Christianity is where scientific revolutions can actually flourish. It's the ancient sacrificial cyclical pattern of history that we were in before Christianity that retards scientific development. And we're going we're gonna to continue to have that same uh, retardation of scientific knowledge and, and progress the longer we uh, rely on trying to increase the power of the transcendent state which is itself, again, a sacrificial primitive entity that's masking itself and messianic Christian language and feelings and so forth um, that we keep relying on to do our research funding, our grant making, our university funding, our, our peer review journal staffing. All that stuff is monopolized. And because it's monopolized, it doesn't know what it doesn't know. And it doesn't have the ability to account for a Galilean uh, dissenting perspective that says, hey, actually, uh, you don't need to uh, rely on your sacrificial violent, your, your sacrificially funded funding mechanisms to solve this problem of dirty energy. We can actually have pollution free, clean energy without having a single government grant, a single grant government subsidy or carbon credit. We can actually solve it if we try this. That's not allowed in academia because they're mimetic and they're in a hive mind just like most of us all are. But they have more danger because they're protected by uh, the special uh, you know, funding that's given to them by the, the sacrificial violence of the state. Well, and the, la the last thing, just kind of a slight side note uh, that I wanted to throw out there was like, do you see, you know, the kind of the – explosion on the on the pop culture landscape of like what someone like Kanye West is doing right now as kind of that indication of the of the the continued strength of the the concept of the 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 Christian uh, mimetic quality or do you see that as a side uh, as kind of a not really in keeping with that tradition uh I think you know I think Kanye West could be a good example of maybe a little bit of a renaissance for uh, Christian values. It's always a little tricky, you know, how to untangle this. Again, remember what I was saying at the beginning that, you know, the full scope of Christianity is not this mental ascent to the metaphysical claims of Christian identity, you know? Um, so a lot of times when people say, okay, this person's now Christian, well, what, what does that mean? Do they understand what the nonviolence of Christianity? Because that's the one of the most primordial, I mean, that's not primordial, that's one of the most essential elements of making a claim like I imitate Jesus. When you call yourself a Christian, that means you're saying I desire to imitate Jesus as the primary mimetic role model for how I will process reality and make sense of things and act and treat myself and treat my neighbor. That's what you're saying. That's not what Christianity is talked about in the conversation in most churches. It may, you know, most churches, and I'm not indicting churches, I'm just saying this is just where we're at. You get more of a, you know, to be a Christian means you got to say Jesus is God. Got that? They don't even know who Jesus is. Just because you say the word Jesus, that's a word. It's a symbol. 
And that can you can impute anything you wanted to that word. So if you say Jesus is God, he was uh, he was born in this time. Do you believe that? Yes. He died on the cross. Do you believe that? Yes. Do you, do you believe he died on the cross because you're bad and you made bad choices? Yes. Okay. And then, you know, he, he raised again. Do you believe that? Yeah, I can see that happening. Okay. Check. Got that one. Uh, do you believe he's going to come again one day and he'll beat up all the, uh, the libs or whatever, whoever your enemy is, conservatives, if you're a liberal Christian? Yep. 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 Got that. Okay. Okay. Got that. Uh, do you believe he's uh, part of a trinity? Yep. Got that. Okay. That means you're a Christian now. In our tradition, we do this kind of baptism. You good with that? Yes, sir. Okay, so we got you good. You're a Christian now. Now, don't masturbate. Don't, you know, the little trip, you know, the, the, the focus on the personal self becomes, you know, don't do this, don't do that. You know, don't, uh, you know, don't be, you know, don't be too greedy. There's a lot of virtue in the in the practical, you know, personal uh, behavior practices of Christian tradition. That's, that's all good, but... Uh, that's not the, that, you know, I can believe all of that and still not be imitating Jesus, right? <laughs> it's just obvious, you know, the fruits of the spirit is love, joy, uh, patience, long suffering, goodness, meekness, gentleness against such things. There is no condemnation. Those are the things that manifest whether you're imitating Jesus or not. So that's what I'm excited about is, is trying to get people, whether you're religiously Christian or not to imitate Jesus, and then you'll functionally be a Christian. You know, so whether you have your metaphysics worked out, maybe you're you don't understand that because you're a product of your times. You don't you're, you think it's embarrassing to believe that someone could resurrect from the dead. And why? Because you would say it's supernatural or you only believe in nature. And I would say, well, mimetically, you don't even really fully know for sure what nature really is, because we are taking by faith the experts who are supposed to be the priestly cast in the scientific world who tell us what nature is. You've, you've, you've taken a leap of faith and accepting that their paradigms that you've presented while they have logic to them and so forth are the end all be all of what nature is. So I would say, you know, you're not really making a scientific indictment on Christianity's claims of having a resurrection in history in a physical sense. Because if you don't know what nature may be, you don't know what super nature would look like. Maybe it's not supernatural after all. Maybe it's actually something in nature that you don't even know about. But that's just the open kind of thing that we need to have, a, have an openness to. The idea that so much of the received bodies of knowledge that we assume are set in stone may in fact be something that we've held on to. Uh, because of a mimetic groupthink uh, blind spot that we're just not aware of because we don't think that humans are so uh, driven by imitation rather than we, we, we think that humans are just walking brains on sticks that have autonomous desires and autonomous faculties fully in and of themselves. And uh, yeah, there's a little bit of imitation. That's just what a few dummies do, but not me and not the scientist people or whoever that I aspire to be like. So yeah, Kanye West seems like a good thing. You know, it seems like a good thing. Uh, we'll see what the fruits of that uh, bear, but uh, I, I just um, I think the more important thing that people need to do is imitate the 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 true message of Jesus, right? So I give you an example. It's very clear, you know, when Jesus comes into Jerusalem and he uh, sees the uh, uh, the uh, the situation at hand in the city that he loves, and he says, "Oh Jerusalem, if you had only known the ways of peace, but they've been hidden from your eyes." What are they hidden by? They're hidden. They're hidden by the self-righteous uh, blind spot that is uh, mimetic groupthink. They they can't see what Jesus is trying to say is their answer. They believe they're going to mimetically respond uh, to the oppression of the Roman occupiers with violent vengeance against them. And Jesus is telling them, it's not going to get you what you want. That's not the kind of kingdom of heaven that I have in mind. And it's just going to have Rome destroy you utterly. And so he says, if you'd only known the ways of peace. So he doesn't say, if you'd only known the ways of eating Chick-fil-A instead of, you know, Burger King, or if you'd only known the ways of the moral majority and the purity culture and all these things, then you would have the real solution. If you'd only known the ways of Trinitarian theology, he doesn't say any of that. He says, if you'd only known the ways of peace. So if you're, if you understand literature, this is a climactic scene. This is when act three is about to begin. You're going to have an intermission 
This is act two is, is concluding. And Jesus is saying, if you'd only known the ways of peace, but now they've been hidden from your eyes. This is when they would do a curtain and they would have an intermission for the final climax that's about to happen in the next scene when the uh, passion story begins. So that's a tell, if you know anything about how literature works, that that's the key issue, which is reiterated over and over and over again, almost on every sentence with Jesus' story, that the key issue about his kingdom is that it's a political reorientation of how humans are going to function. He's going to strip us of our ability to find meaning and order and hierarchy based on sacrificial violence being initiated. He's going to remove that. He's going to, he's not going to remove it overnight. That's why the church and everybody still sacrificially kills people through history and all these things. It's not like some kind of magic bullet. This is not an infomercial. This is a process that's like a yeast working itself in a loaf, which is what humanity is experiencing right now that he's going to strip us of our ability to be ignorant to the sacred violence that we do. He's going to allow us to see that the victims that we select as our enemies are not really that, uh, you know, guilty of all the problems that we aspire to throw onto them. And then he's going to deprive us of the unifying effect of those victims that at that time in history uh, had been the unifying effect that bound communities together and kept them from being extinguished by uh, runaway violence. And so he's going to strip that sacred violence of its sacredness. He's going to reorient our desires towards love and mercy, not sacrifice. That's why he says, my father desires mercy, not sacrifice. He's going to strip us of our ability to believe that we are the unique originators of our desires. That's why he says, imitate me, be like me. And then, oh, by the way, everything I do is an imitation too. It's an imitation of my father in heaven, who we all have as our father. And he's also an imitation of all the prophets that had come before me, who were also critiquing the, the domain of the sacred violence that he's exposing. So he's saying the most unique man in history is saying everything I do is imitation. And so everything you should do is imitating my imitation. And so he's trying to get you to see the mimetic nature that is what's behind so much of what we do already. Uh, he's, he's unveiling our desires. He's unveiling our, our reciprocity of, uh, of goodness, how to, how, to, how to set a contagious um, wildfire of positive imitation because mimetic desire is not always evil. It's meant to be good. It's how we learn. It's how we transmit ideas. It's how we create technologies. It's how we love and forgive each other. Uh, it's that reciprocity of goodness and uh, respect and confidence that he's trying to instill in those who imitate him by reading his story and learning about his life by the way other people imitate it in their own time. That's his counterculture. And it's happening. It's going to continue to destroy our ability to have bind. We, we will not be bound together anymore. You, you see the flag. It doesn't even unite us at football games anymore. Football games are a vestige of the Colosseum rituals of ancient times where you come together and you watch simulated warfare. In the ancient world, when Jesus' time, they would kill people. They would tear people's chests and hearts and entrails apart. And people would roar with love and, and adoration for the for the ecstasy of the sacrificial violence being done against the gladiators or slaves or what have you. Uh, today we do football or, or things like that, but we simulate the violence with nice cushions because we're concerned about our, our, you know, modern vestige of a gladiator. We're concerned about them getting a concussion. I can assure you in Jesus' time in the Roman Empire, no one was concerned about a gladiator getting a freaking concussion during their spectacle. They did not have a concern for their victims of sacrifice. Uh, they were also not concerned with how their gladiators treated their spouses or girlfriends, like has been a scandal in the NFL as well, where there's these stories of football players having uh, domestic violence issues and, and how that taints the glory of the game. So we are thoroughly Christianized in this sense, not, but we're not ready. We're like half Christian. We're thoroughly within the the fishbowl of Christianity, but we're, we're only half Christian in the sense that we're aware of victimization and we're aware of the brutality of violence in more, in more earlier times in our recent history, but we don't want to fully recognize it 
and how it affects and what we do today. So we want to be able to believe that when we say lock them up and put someone away for being a, a drug dealer, that we're justifying that violence. It has nothing to do with the same kind of sacred violence that we did in ancient times when we would stone people for being a witch doctor. We don't want to connect that at all. We don't, we don't want to see that as the continuation of the same uh, mythic lie that justified that kind of stuff. We don't want to see that. Even those who go to Christian every uh, Christian church every Sunday have a hard time seeing that. But, but nevertheless, Christianity was still having the biggest impact of any other force in the world. It is fully in the driver's seat of history. Uh, political correctness will continue to be a kind of... Uh, uh, a, 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 a desperate and cheap imitation of the real thing. And, the, and what we have to do is that those who want to defend order and the rule of law and uh, beauty and prosperity and capital and uh, innovation and love and, and having our neighborhoods cleaned up, we have to say this stuff. We have to talk about the, the, the hidden victims of our society. And the best way to do that is to tell their stories because that's how Jesus' story destroyed so much of the sacred violence that has, it has destroyed that we've inherited the, the results of in the modern world. It is the fact that people read the story of a wrongly accused person persecuted by his whole community. One week they adored him because he was the one elected for the mandate, so to speak, by the crowd. The next week, they wanted to destroy him and kill him, and they moved like a mob. It wasn't the domain of the gods that demanded that Jesus die. It was the domain of humans. It was the domain of us. It was the domain of his own friends who betrayed him, even though they hang out with him for the last three years. They sold him out when the crowd said, hey, do you know this guy? And he said, I have no idea who this guy is. Even Peter said that. That's representative of the mimetic power that we're still uh, slow to wake up to today. But it's right in front of our eyes in that text. And that's why uh, that story of Jesus' wrongful persecution and the fact that uh, Pilate and Herod, it says in the book of Luke, are reconciled uh, uh, by the king of the Jews and the governor of the Roman interests in that region are reconciled through their common persecution of Jesus. That story uh, deconstructs the mythological myth-making attempts that, that we still try to resurrect today. It deconstructs us and allows us to see it for what it is. And it allows us to see that God, or if you're scared of that word, God, put the word highest social ordering principle. The highest social ordering principle stands on the side of the wrongly accused one and condemns the actions of the many. So God stands on the side of the misfit. He stands on the side of the ostracized one. He stands on the side of each person who has to receive the uh, violence and exclusion that is the, the, the spirit of collectivism in the crowd. He stands on that side and he reorients all of history from henceforth to be one in which the person becomes paramount, not the collective, in which human dignity and what we call human rights become paramount, not uh, the, the idea that might makes right. And that's why all of our attempts at trying to continue the old order will continue to fail because Jesus, in effect, in the Christian story, has filed down the teeth of the state. So the state is still brutal. It's still violent. It's still disgusting. And what we are doing and as a part of it is still wrong. But it's just not violent enough to, to, to create any of the effects of the ancient world. You know, uh, we, we put we put people who do, you know, who sell a drug, we put them in jail with, you know, some AC and some food and three square meals and they can get a degree. It's not violent enough. You know, if, if you wanted to go that way. You would have to like, you know, publicly torture people in the public square who sell drugs. We're never going to do that. I don't think, you know, they think it's awful. But what I'm saying is that's what the ancient world would do for the equivalent kind of uh, targets of, of the community's wrath that we're trying to target with the drug war and so on. You'd have to have utter brutality. And because of Christianity softening our appetite for that level of brutality, the kind of violence that we still employ to coerce people to do what we want them to do is not efficacious enough to produce the fruit that we're supposed to pr produce with that, which is to deter people from using drugs or selling drugs or whatever other vice that we have to use government power to police.
Well, I, I think that's actually a, a great place to to end this this podcast on. I mean, I I can't tell you how much I really enjoyed the, the you know the conversation. Uh, I'm just absolutely fascinated by this as I've, I've started to fall deeply down this rabbit hole. Um, I'd love to have you back on the future as I kind of explore this mimetic theory and how it kind of applies to the different places that uh, that this podcast goes. Um, but you know, how can people consume your content and and get a hold of you? You can email me David at a neighbor's choice.com. That's David at a neighbor's choice.com. Uh, my website's a neighbor's choice.com. I don't actively put new content on there. It's more like a teaching page, like a landing page. We can learn a few principles for practical purposes. Um, and it, it, there's going to be more work to, to, to pull all of my work together to that hub eventually. I just have way too many projects going on at this time to, to get that properly uh, looked at fully. But I do my radio program, A Neighbor's Choice. Uh, I do that um, each night, Mondays through Thursdays on WFLA in Orlando, which is the top uh, iHeart Media radio station in that Orlando metro market. You can listen online by joining my Facebook. If you type in David Gronoski and join me on there, I post the video live streams there where you can follow along the work that we do. Um, and then I do a podcast called Things Hidden, which is a reference to Jesus' statement about revealing things. Hidden is the foundation of the world. And that is on Apple, iTunes, and all the other podcast platforms of significance. Um, Things Hidden uh, by David Gronoski. You can subscribe to that. I appreciate because I just started that and I'm just it's just in its early stages. Um, also subscribe to my YouTube channel, David Gronoski. Subscribe there and I post some of my radio episodes and podcasts on there. And I also post some of my YouTube exclusive interviews with folks like Jordan Peterson. I interviewed him the day his book came out, 12 Rules for Life. And person together in New York City, had a great discussion with him there. Uh, David Bentley Hart, the noted theologian and New Testament translator, have a great discussion with him and Peter Schiff and Ron Paul and Walter Williams and scientists and physicists and all. I mean, we just go everywhere because we're having fun with this. Once you have the right toolkit, once you understand how the patterns of human uh, error work and how to be policing yourself constantly and, and being very nimble in that way of, of using the mimetic framework, it allows you to take that fun toolkit and go off to the races in a variety of uh, different fields of interest. So uh, been a pleasure talking to you. Yeah. And, and uh, as far as forgetting that toolkit, just real quick, what books would you recommend um, for people to start reading to kind of get a, 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 a introductory uh, level of understanding of mimetic theory? Well, the way I've framed it, you know, is not just within mimetic theory. So I'm using mimetic theory as like a as a touch point to get you started. So I'm pulling from media ecology and, and, and you know economics and my own my own insights that I'm trying to pull all this together. But for mimetic theory specifically, because uh, it's not I, I, I say that just to say when you read some of his of Gerard's work, you know, it's not going to have the full implications of what I've spelled out. It's been my own work that's kind of extended it to certain areas that he didn't uh, specifically address as much. But I would recommend uh, his book, I See Satan Fall Like Lightning, uh, which is, I believe, $17 on Amazon. And it's about 180 pages or so, 200 pages. And that's a good book. It's written in a very kind of clunky, kind of technical way. But I would just stay with it. That's the first book I read of his. And I would just read it slowly and digest it. And if you have a question, you can email me, david at a neighborschoice.com. You can also join my community on Facebook where we have a lot of fellow travelers who are also versed in mimetic theory and who can give you a lot of help and guidance. But once you get it, it's the biggest you know, game changer for understanding a lot of the processes. We've only... I've been very, <laughs> we've covered a lot. This is a two hour conversation. This is like a feature length movie of discussion. And I haven't even scratched the surface about the implications of how it helps you understand everything that's going on. I know it sounds too good to be true because we want to believe in specialist knowledge and those things are important, but it's true that you can see these patterns 
come alive when you understand how essential uh, the gospel is and understanding everything in our headlines today. It helps you understand why all the top superhero movies all deal with self-sacrifice. 